to the kickoff event of the fifth Behavioral Science Week at the United Nations. We're very, very happy to have you. My name is Ayaka Suzuki. I'm the Director of Strategic Planning and Monitoring Unit of the Secretary General's Office. As you know, behavioral science is now firmly established as part of the Secretary General's quintet of change and a cornerstone of his agenda to reform the United Nations. And we hope that this event will highlight the importance and impact of the application of behavioral science to how uh, we're making progress in UN mandates. And also, uh, it will showcase successes, challenges, and learnings from applying behavioral science across the UN and discuss how to leverage insights to further progress and promote uh, collaboration across the UN family. So um, I'm very happy to start with a short video um, by the Under Secretary General for Policy, Guy Ryder. Um, he is the uh, Under Secretary General uh, for Policy in the Secretary General's office. And as many of you may know, he was the former Director General of International Labor Organization. Um, he wanted to be here in person, but was, um, uh, was called away to a, an urgent meeting. So with that, um, over to the video, please. Dear colleagues, I'm pleased to kick off this fifth UN Behavioral Science Week in which we highlight and build on the excellent work that is being done by UN practitioners in this area of rapidly emerging significance. The world is changing profoundly and at an unprecedented speed. The skills and capabilities of the people in our organization must evolve too. That is a precondition for us to do our job effectively. And so the Secretary General has committed to building next generation skills in data, innovation, digital, strategic foresight and behavioural science, our quintet of change to make us ready for the increasingly complex challenges that we will face in the future. In line with the recommendations in the Secretary General's Our Common Agenda report, the objective is to be a truly 21st century organisation increasingly nimble, dynamic, and effective, UN 2.0. Behavioral science is one of the newer and perhaps less well-known and understood tools in this task, but it does hold tremendous potential to help us design better policies, programs, and administrative processes. And because so much of the work of the United Nations relies on changing behavior, such as taking medicine, allowing a child to attend school, halting violence and brokering peace agreements, understanding how people actually behave and make decisions is absolutely essential. And behavioral science enables us to identify barriers preventing people from taking action, to understand incentives that can help people achieve their aims, and to design and measure the impact of interventions on the basis of these assessments. Both inside and outside of the UN, behavioural science has shown what it can deliver. And the UN is using behavioural science for more impact and for better results. And we've seen many new initiatives and progress in this space over the past year. You're going to hear about many of them this week. For example, in complex and fragile settings, behavioural science is helping to improve collaboration across our humanitarian development and peace operations. And there are initiatives on health, climate, gender, and peace and security. They include the UNDP Accelerator Labs, UNICEF's Behavioral Insights Research and Design Lab, and the World Bank's Mind, Behavior, and Development Unit. And over the last year, the UN Behavioral Science Group launched the pilot UN Behavioral Science Fellowship, bringing behavioral scientists into the UN to address issues such as increasing domestic worker social security registration with the ILO and reducing administrative burdens in internal UN operations together with FAO and the UN office in Geneva. And a large number of governments in both the Global North and the Global South have established teams and initiatives to promote the application of behavioral science and to embed it in their everyday work. To build upon and to amplify these efforts, the UN Behavioral Science Group is facilitating discussions and collaboration amongst member states and UN Behavioral Science practitioners. All of this means that the UN is well positioned to harness the benefits of behavioral science 
and I hope that the activities of this week will move us forward to seeing it applied in all parts of the UN. Great. So that was a very comprehensive update. Um, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce the first panel, the illustrious uh, panelists. So may I invite panel members to uh, to turn on their video cameras? Great. So we have, um, do I have Deanne? She's there. So um, Deanne Keita who's Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director for Programs at the United Nations Population Fund. She was also Minister for Cooperation African Immigration within uh, the Republic of Guinea, and um, she also served as UNFPA representative in Mauritania, Benin, DRC, and Nigeria, some of the largest UNFPA's uh, program countries globally. And we also have Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, um, currently Global Director for Poverty and Equity Global Practice at the World Bank Group. And uh, he was also formerly a colleague at the United Nations, um, Assistant Secretary General and Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean at UNDP. And uh, Dean Carlin, who is Chief Economist at USAID AID, and also Professor of Economics and Finance at Northwestern University. And he was founder and former president of Innovations for Poverty Action, which is an NGO dedicated to discovering and promoting solutions to global poverty problems. And finally, we have Professor Lucia Reich, who is a director um, at El Irian Institute of Behavioral Economics and Policy at the University of Cambridge. So um, I'll kick off with, uh, with Dan. The UNFPA has been uh, quite a pioneer in the UN system and has been involved in many behavioral science projects and, and also UN-wide behavioral science initiative for quite some time. So um, it would be great if you could share with us some specific examples of how behavioral science has played a role and the impact it has had in UNFPA's work. Over to you, Dan. Thank you so much, dear Ayaka, Madam Chair. Um, esteemed uh, panelists, I'm so happy and privileged to be with you all today for to kick off this week. Um, distinguished colleagues, friends, partners, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, behavioral science, it's so important in the job we do every day. We have to change social norm for, for what we do. So I'm really delighted to be able to speak about UNFP experience on it. We have incorporated uh, behavioral science in our work in various ways uh, in order to address population issues, reproductive health issues around the world. So there are a few examples. I can give you example on family planning and contraceptive use or in adolescent sexual reproductive health, gender-based violence, or even on data, civil register and vital statistics. Let me start by that. Um, civil registry and vital statistics are an area where UNFP recognized the importance of behavioral science. The registration of marriage and divorces is critical for promoting gender equality and the right of women and girls. It can serve, therefore, as a safeguard against early and child marriage, promote gender equality within marital union, and empowers women through inheritance right, parental guardianship right, and the right to remarry. Through behavioral science research, we have identified gender norms and behavioral factors that hinder the universal registration of marriage and divorces. And uh, UNFPA leadership on gender dimension of civil registration and vital statistics is increasingly uh, thanks uh, to leveraging behavioral science to unravel the drivers of exclusion and invisibility throughout the life course. That's one example. Another example could be adolescent and sexual and reproductive health. Behavioral science has been instrumental in designing intervention to improve the sexual and reproductive health of adolescent. UNFP has utilized insight from behavioral research to develop programs that address the social norms, peer influences, and decision-making process among young people. And by tailoring our intervention 
to the unique needs and preference and contextualize also in terms of culture, uh, the adolescent needs, UNFP has been able to increase access to accurate information, promote healthy behavior, and reduce risky sexual practice. We are still working, for instance, on a comprehensive sexuality education that is very touchy. The thematic, the way it's used, the way it is called, depending the region. We are we're going to need the help of everyone and the partner agency, UNICEF, UNESCO, DESA, to ensure that we use the right terminology to make sure that we can address and access young people and give them what they need in order to fulfill their potential. I don't know what time I have, but I can continue giving examples. Let me, the last one may be uh, on family planning and contraceptive use. That's very important as well. You need to take care of the culture, to take care of how people uh, react about it. Not only the women, but as well the, the men, the companion, because it's very, very important. And in an instance like Niger, for instance, we have school of husband to make sure that we uh, promote positive masculinity and involve a lot of faith-based organization in order to try to impact on behavior. But maybe Ayak, I'll stop there for time being, not to take all the time. I thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Well, it was concise but comprehensive and a very, very um, important work that UNFP is doing. And hopefully we'll get back for an, an additional rounds as well. So thank you for that. Um, and now over to Luis Felipe. So the World Bank has conducted a large number of behavioral science projects, including the work of this uh, Mind Behavior and Development Unit. Could you highlight areas of key opportunities and impact you're seeing for integrating behavioral science into policy and programs to address poverty and inequality? Thank you very much, Ayaka. It's really nice to see you again. Um, I want to start by you know, sending my regards to USG Guy Ryder and uh, ASG Dean Keita, Chief Economist in Carlin and Professor Lucia Reich. It's really a privilege to be part of this conversation. Um, the way in which mental models, uh, social norms, and mindsets uh, relate to development outcomes and how to address them via poli uh, uh, policy tools has been part of the World Bank work already for a long time. Um, it certainly gained more momentum um, with the WDR 2015, the World Development Report 2015, uh, which precisely discussed at length the use of behavioral science in development that was under the leadership of uh, Chief Economist Koshik Basu at that time. Currently, the, the, this work is led, uh, as you mentioned, Ayaka, by our behavioral team, hosted, is hosted within the Poverty and Equity Global Practice, and it's a group of very capable and highly committed colleagues led by Renaud Vakis, Ana Maria Munoz, and Zeina Afif. Um, recently, World Bank President Ajay Banga uh, established uh, as a line of sight for our mission, the pursuit of a world free of poverty in a livable planet. Such goal can only be achieved if we enhance our capacity to understand better the behavioral barriers people face in their decision making and to incorporate better the behavioral interventions in our policy design. And when we integrate behavioral science in our work, uh, there are important uh, impacts that we have observed and also more opportunities uh, to improve uh, our results. I will mention four. The first one is related precisely to how we address behavioral barriers to poverty alleviation. We have leveraged academic work on scarcity and the psychology of poverty to improve policies, uh, to reduce chronic poverty and to escape poverty traps. One typical example for, uh, is, is the low take up of programs designed to alleviate poverty that have shown to, to uh, be successful, um, so like social housing, employment programs, cash transfers and more, and yet people uh, tend to uh, have low enrollments. Always the first task of the teams is to disentangle the structural constraints from the behavioral constraint. It's very important also not to claim that everything can be solved through behavioral interventions. So we work both on the diagnostics, the process of policy design. This is the second element, because sometimes in their complexity, 
the processes of policy design end up establishing barriers to access. So it's important to address those, uh, but also in addition, the barriers, as I said, that the individuals face, such as motivation, aspirations, uh, the persistence of certain behaviors, and it's important to know how to address them. The third point I want to make is the relevance of our lens on inclusion and equity in everything we do. So our focus is on equity. The behavioral science work has allowed us to zoom in on the bar barriers that uh, some disadvantaged groups experience. Uh, so we try to understand them uh, better uh, to design interventions that are more equitable, reduce disparities, and leave no one behind. For example, we have worked uh, uh, with this um, embed uh, team since the beginning to measure barriers such as social norms, stereotypes, testing interventions to address them, for example, to increase girls' education access or female labor force participation. We also look at biases among frontline workers and teachers and how they can affect uh, children's outcomes. The fourth and last point I want to make is the relevance of evidence-based policy design. We all the time work with data. That's uh, the, the, the work we do is always based on data, but going beyond the traditional data and looking at behavioral diagnostics has really given us more information uh, for a specific context and to, uh, has allowed us to understand better specific issues uh, in the design of uh, policy by governments. So the behavioral team is always uh, brought in to deal with the delivery um, and try to look at these take up challenges and bring new evidence that can lead to more informed decision making and more efficient use of resources. So let me just close by reiterating that um, while economics is all about behavior, uh, we have for a long time understood um, the, that uh, psychology and mindsets are a fundamental aspect of policy design if we really want it to be more likely to succeed. I leave it there for now. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. And I really um, think it's 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 uh, very um, instructive that both your comments and, and the end comments really reinforce each other with an eye to impact, but also really how behavioral science can be used as a tool to minimize uh, exclusion and, and to be more inclusive. So um, thank you so much. So now um, um, over to Dean. So your work at um, USAID has focused on behavioral science over the last few decades. Um, I, I understand being at the forefront of behavioral science applications, particularly, particularly in low uh, middle income countries. Uh, could you share with us a few lessons you have learned in designing and implementing behavioral science projects? Luis Felipe just talked about being evidence uh, based and, 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 and the whole uh, policy making self needs to be informed. So, so how how what have you learned uh, in that process, including implications for the impact of USAID and UN today? Over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's a it's it's a real honor to be here with with this um, set of um, this this full panel, and I thank you for inviting me to this, and look forward to hearing about more of the fruits of the week, etc. So I have well one thing just to clarify is I'm new at USA, um, so six months in. Um, so I'm I'm going to speak more about my experience as a as a researcher and as the founder of Innovations for Poverty Action, and and board member for Jamil Poverty Action Lab um, in my prior prior capacity. But some of it does relate to work we're trying to now do at USA as well. So I'm going to basically I want to share three basic thoughts. One is diagnose. The second is about distinguishing between short run and long run in terms of tests and what we mean by behavioral science and, and where it falls into the, into the theory of whatever it is the program is or policy that we're doing. And the third is the shortest, which is just to kind of, in a sense, lower expectations some <laughs> um, from the way they often, often get talked about always. So the first is, you know, one of the things that I think is, you know, an, you know, it's both a sign of success and it's also a potential, you know, hiccup is the a lot of times there's a, a lot of unbridled enthusiasm, which is exciting and fun. And it's obviously fun to be around enthusiasm. But um, but, you know, behavioral science and the ideas that come out of behavioral science sometimes are are kind of uh, a little bit too much like a bunch of ideas that get thrown at the wall. And then, like, let's just throw them out there and see what sticks. 
Um, and that might work for spaghetti, but it's not a great way of designing programs. And the first thing we really want to do in any sort of problem is diagnose and try to understand what's the problem here. And if it's behavioral in the in the sense of cognitive um, cognitive biases and kind of the classic way that behavioral science got started, then you know we're talking about something that maybe has very high cognitive cost to get a decision right. Something where maybe attention is being pulled in in multiple directions. Maybe there's a temptation issue. Maybe beliefs are are misplaced over optimism or under optimism. And, and so these are all falling into various categories of, of, of nudges, of, of saying, you know, alter a little bit how a program is done, how it's delivered, how it's marketed, how the decision making process takes place. And with a better understanding of where decisions are going awry, you can then um, guide people to the decision that they would say they want in a moment of deep reflection and full information. Um, but that all requires diagnosing, and a lot of times the issue is not one of those. Sometimes it's just straight up cost, or maybe the service is bad. Um, maybe there's a, a deeper friction in the market. And so having understanding what that problem is is actually really important so that we're not just sticking a Band-Aid on a, on a big gaping wound, in a sense. Um, so that's the first thought is just really, you know, it really does help to, to think critically about what what the underlying problem is and um, in designing and thinking through what to do. The second is on short run versus long run. I think I think there's, you know, broadly speaking, there's two types of, of moments that we see behavioral science coming into play, and they are actually very different in the way they play out. One is kind of things like I mentioned, where there might be a very short intervention. Maybe it's a text message to remind somebody about uh, some preventative medicine or reminding them to save. It's a very short run. It's using administrative data. You can get rapid fire testing. You can actually iterate a lot. And so you can learn a lot quickly. And, um, and that can be exciting. But keep in mind, when you do things like that, a lot of times, you're, you're going to do something that's very cheap to do, or maybe even free to do, or maybe even saves money to do with negative cost, and you're going to get back at a very quick answer, but you're probably not going to radically change the impact of a program, but you might actually make a cost-effective shift in the way the program's done. The other is when it lies at the heart of the program. It is a cognitive behavioral therapy program, for instance, working with um, depressed households in rural Ghana this is something we've done. And, you know, that's a year, two year, that's a large scale impact evaluations. And yes, it's behavioral science at the heart of this, um, but that is a much larger, more ambitious, but also much longer uh, effort. And so that's, you know, looks and smells a lot more like things that we put under the umbrella of impact evaluation. Um, and, and so the behavioral science jargon, I think, gets, gets, um, gets used in both of those ways, and it's very helpful to distinguish in terms of setting expectations for le appropriate levels of investment, timing to measure impacts, et cetera. And so then the last point I want to leave with is really more focused on the first type, like the rapid fire, rapid fire tests, like sending text messages and things of this nature. What's striking is these can be so cheap that they can make a they can make an impact as a return on investment. But a lot of times people put that I, I've seen some situations um, where people put that foot forward like it's going to solve all problems, and that's just unfortunately not usually the case. Usually the you know you got to think about what the core program is, what the core policy program is that is being done. And, and a lot of times behavioral science can help improve the operations for the way it's done, but you can't rely on that as like the approach for how to how to solve a problem in a lot of in a lot of cases. Certainly not the not not the examples I was giving with uh, you know simple things like attention and and temptation. There's often some very core thing that needs to also get it. You need to get that right. So that's my um, looking forward to the rest. Those are my those are my three thoughts. Uh, uh, looking forward to comments, questions, discussions. And okay, great. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks. panelists may wish to refer to some of your points, uh, your learnings uh, later on, but uh, certainly uh, very well noted on behavioral science is a tool, but not the magic wand. So thank you for that. And now over to Lucia. Um, so our question to you is, um, so your academic and applied work has focused on the use of behavioral science to promote societal welfare and sustainable development. 
And in which areas do you see the largest opportunities for the UN to apply behavioral science to make progress toward impact? Over to you. Yes, thank you. And thanks so much for having me. Um, so using the behavioral approach has four huge advantages. One is, and we've just heard that, it is often quite inexpensive compared to financial incentives or subsidies, infrastructure projects. So it can sometimes work in areas and in for, for problems that have to be solved in, in, an inexpensive, uh, in an inexpensive way. Second, it is it is fast. So if you have trained people with behavioral skills and, and some clear process tools, uh, and they are available today, the UN has actually published such a kit last year, like a starter kit. It can be, I mean, the, the, at least the, the project, the intervention can be started quite quickly. So you usually do not need, need a long process like you need in a law or a tax. And of course, all the rules of good governance uh, must be kept. Uh, but this is this can be an advantage. I mean, it's all about the individual uh, problem and uh, about the individual project. And also um, picking up on what has just been said, it can also last long if the intervention succeeds, for instance, in changing habits. So if it's not a one off, but I kind of in an intervention that comes in several uh, in, in several parts. Third, it's adaptable. So we just heard about different ideas about masculinity and femininity. So it can be culturally adapted, adapted to the level of accepted intrusion, accepted to the to different political systems that might some of them might find paternalism uh, in some nudges and others might think, wow, this is still pretty libertarian. So that makes a lot of sense for the UN as you know, almost 200 countries from very, very different backgrounds and political systems. And fourth, uh, if done well, it can be pretty precise. It can personalized and targeted to individual groups and group needs. So I think these are these are four huge advantages that um, other instruments uh, uh, in their uh, at least uh, original form uh, do not have. So based on that, against that that backdrop, I think um, the the UN, a family with almost 200 countries, rich and poor, many of them in the global south, and I do think that should be one of the focus of the UN to have maximal impact and welfare gains. Uh, I, I think I would like to pick two applications of many, many. Uh, the first uh, is actually, and it's of course not by accident that I'm focusing for practically all of my behavioral work on the SDG. So climate action, biodiversity, sustainable consumption. So, and the reason being, these are very, very urgent ones and uh, are largely also conducted on a kind of very system level, and they would all benefit, do benefit, as also the latest IPCC report has shown, to add more the behavioral lens and to focus also on the demand side with uh, non-traditional instruments. Uh, and just thinking of, for instance, sustainable and healthy food, Food systems, I mean, this is certainly an area where we cover climate, biodiversity, obesity, malnutrition, as well as inequality, justice, food security. So, uh, and because, for instance, the food system, many small behavioral changes are needed and are possible, even without large structural changes, that seems to be a very promising uh, uh, um, area which does not mean that we do not also need structural changes, right? Um, yes, but it's a lot about behavioral plasticity. It's about exposure, taste, habit formation. And as I said, many small decisions, and that might be a bit different from other areas such as let's take mobility, which is very often much about enabling infrastructures or finance where we basically need good tax laws and good redistributive policies. So that could be uh, a, or is actually, I think, a very valuable area. The second uh, choice uh, of, I think, very valuable application is more about processes. And this is both for the Global North and the Global South. This is about reducing what people like Hassan Sin have called sludge. So reducing administrative burden, make programs 
platforms use more user friendly, make policies more effective. There's so much outdated regulation, slow processes, unnecessarily slow processes, and behavioral science can indeed help improve also existing and traditional instruments. And uh, while well, applying a sludge audit is something that some governments have, have actually done and uh, have therewith eased access to all kinds of public goods and services to many people who otherwise would simply not be as uh, resourceful. They do not have the time. They do not understand complicated forms. And this is certainly something that behavioral science can inform. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And um, uh, also, I mean, take your point. It's not either or. It really, we need both behavioral science, uh, which is in, integrated in a broader policy ecosystem, the structural and so forth, based on evidence. Okay, so uh, now we will do a um, rapid fire round and feel free to react to what you've heard from your co-panelists as well, but it would be great if you could um, share what you think is the most important factor for scaling behavioral science initiatives to with a view to achieving impact at the UN. If you could really focus on one factor, that would be great. So uh, let's go back to Diane. Thank you, Ayaka. Uh, it was fantastic listening to my co-panelists, really. Um, a lot of respect. Um, if I had to take only one, I would really build on partnership. Uh, because, you know, just listening to the panelists, we do that, the diagnosis, whether Luis, Dean, or what Lucia said, are all important in what we do. And there is an aspect that is very difficult, at least in the job I do, even if we have all those information, the right diagnostic, the right information, yet the political aspect kick in, kick, kick in, in the political air, arena. So you are nice, but uh, comprehensive charity education, not for us, because one, two, three, four. So for me, partnering with institution research and other agency may ease my work because everybody's doing part of the job. I'll stop there. Partnering for me is absolutely essential. Thank you. Great, thank you. Luis Felipe. Thank you. Um, very briefly, one point, but it it it, it needs two elements to, to it. So the first is to really incorporate this uh, approach in the policy cycle from the very beginning. So one is that it's not that at the end you come up with oh this something is not going right. Let's try to do a firefighter approach. I think it is important to really have it as an essential part of the policy cycle. But in order to do that, and that the, the other element is, as we call it, is meeting your partners where they are, in the sense they are means context specific, but also in terms of capacity. We need to, uh, we try to really get close to those who are going to implement, to understand also their capacity constraints, and to work really uh, to build that capacity. Otherwise, uh, uh, even the best intervention uh, is likely not to be successful if you don't have the right capacity. So these two elements, I would put it in one uh, in one uh, element of being more strategic about bringing this into the policy cycle. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dean. I I think the answer answer was perfect. I'm <laughs> I'm going to just second that and and be quiet because that was just okay. Great. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, yes, following up on that, I think mainstream and educate so to make as many people in the agencies and beyond use the behavioral lens, understand what that is, analyzing the problem from a behavioral perspective, seeking for behavioral remedies. So behavioral literacy also includes, of course, making people aware of the risks of behavioral uh, approaches, because there's, of course, not, not only good but also bad and dark patterns and uh, I think uh, particularly also now with all the possibilities that uh, AI brings us it also brings lots of, of, of risks so kind of understanding making them uh, very um, smart about the use of uh, the behavioral lens would be probably something that would help in different domains. Great thank you. Uh, so uh, maybe if I can uh, come back and ask you, 
I mean, I think Dean mentioned the need for partnering, which I mean, I can also relate to as well. So um, what do you think uh, we can do better to across the UN to better support each other or to unblock resistance or to, to you know, as a number of you have said, mainstream behavioral science that will ultimately lead to better impact. So um, maybe I can do this in a reverse order, starting with Lucia. Yeah, I think what you, well, I, I know more about uh, businesses and, and uh, uh, the supply side, but what usually helps there a lot is to show successful examples, learning from others, uh, exchanging experiences, support with knowledge and networks. And for that, you don't even need huge budgets. And if some, something works in one place, of course, uh, it's not guaranteed that it, it will work in the other place, but it could. And uh, so nothing is as successful as successful examples. Great, thank you, Dean. So I think it's there's a I think there's a lot of training that goes on in this space, and and we need to do you know. And I'm not saying it's bad. Training can whet appetites, but um, but the you know the devil's a little bit in the details about how these how the work is actually done and and actually forming partnerships where um where there's a, a clear scaling moment in which something can be built in and tested and there's good data and you know stars have to be aligned for that and so there's a little bit of a challenge with you know like our our, our standard kind of um training and get people in get people excited and then but you know you need to really have a very clear like I know we are we are about to make big policy decisions we're about to scale up a certain program here's the decision points that we have here's the levers that we the moments in which we can do something here's the data that we'll have and then in a very practical way that's when that's when engagements can happen and they don't those you don't usually happen exactly when we're running training programs so there's this I think there's this disconnect with the with the kind of the the common um, you know kind of training model, so to speak, an executive ed model from the more consulting like model that, in which you can actually get stuff done. Great, thank you, Luis Felipe. Thank you. Um, two points. One is related to this issue of the capacity. I think um, when we talk about capacity, we tend to think of building capacity for the counterpart, but I think we should not underestimate the need to build capacity within our own organizations and, and also changing the mental model in our organizations and, and the mindset that this is part of the, of the policy cycle. So, so that, that is one element. And the second is that when we think about the whole value chain of these, let's say, of these interventions, uh, every organization, of course, needs to be ready to support uh, our, uh, I mean, member states uh, in terms of the whole intervention, how to design, how to implement. But it's important that we have these type of conversations more often and our technical teams as well to find the spaces where we can be really complementary. And then we are strong in, in certain aspects, but the others are have more presence, more, more uh, capacity, for example, in the implementation. So the idea of where are the, the elements of complementarity, even if, so we don't have, it start from the idea that we have to deliver the whole value chain uh, individually, but we can find those who are more able to do parts of it in the specific context. And that can only, uh, we can only uh, find these, these examples when we are really in constant uh, communication like the one we're having today. So I think this is very important. So this is also a way to celebrate and perhaps encourage more exchange like this one. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and your point about needing to build our own capacity is exactly what Sector General's UN 2.0 is about. So, uh, so I really appreciate your uh, making that point. Um, Dian. Yes, I think I agree with everything that has been said before me. We need to improve our own capacity, that's for sure. Uh, I spent my weekend reading back on the 2.0 and the Kentet and, you know, went to the OCA just to make sure that I was on the right panel when I saw the list of the person attending. I said, look, this is no joke. Let me get ready for my thing. And, and seriously, and this training should go beyond uh, ourselves and should go for our member states. Uh, you take researcher or you know, scientist, but if you take the politician, things change totally. 
um, just a very quick example, two, two, two training that are very needed for me. Let's take, um, we talk about private sector a lot, but if the Global South want to change um, the youth and adolescent issue, we need public sector. We need the nurses, we need the midwives, we need the teachers. But those teachers, you don't want the classic one. You want the one who can learn those things at the same time, who cannot be blockage, but open open mind that new generation. You know, same thing as the politicians sitting in the beautiful UN rooms. You know, that they forget that they come sometimes from villages who needs that. So that how do we do that kind of training? Uh, I think I love what we did our board last week to have a one hour and a half session on talking about population issues, demographic issues, resilience issues. Because if people don't learn, we are not going to get anywhere. I stop there, thank you. Great, well, thank you very much. The, the, this, this, this very brief but very rich exchange really shows, um, as Luis Felipe said, the need to continue this kind of a dialogue. But I mean, I think that um, there's so much um, key insights that came out of it and I think I really hope that, I mean, there are a lot of people tuned, tuned into this. I saw 350 or so people at some point, now down to 320, but still a large group of people for nine o'clock in the morning on a Monday. So um, it also shows the, uh, the great level of interest. And also, I mean, there are many questions um, from the audience as well. I mean, unfortunately, you don't have time to get to um, to, to all of them, but um, we will make sure that, uh, for example, there are some specific questions uh, directed at UNFPA that our colleagues will get back to your colleagues to so that the, these uh, responses uh, can be uh, provided. But now I think I just want to um, uh, turn briefly to Mary, uh, Mary McLennan, who, as many of you know, uh, is a behavioral scientist and has been advising our office on behavioral science issues, and she's the lead of the UN Behavioral Science Group at the UN Innovation Network. So Mary, maybe you could address some of the questions um, um, that were raised by um, uh, the audience here, but also to, uh, to, to, to brief us on what the Behavioral Science Network is up to, because um, I mean, it's exactly the kind of things that the, when we talk about partnering, that's what this um, network is trying to do. So over to you, Mary. Great. Thank you, Ayaka. And thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you today about behavioral science in the UN. So we might um, come back to the questions if there's time at the end of my remarks to, to see how we can maybe go a bit deeper into them. But um, I wanted to speak to three things in the short amount of time that I have. So first, I wanted to provide some context on UN Behavioral Science Week, which is taking place over the next five days. Um, then I will speak to an update in terms of behavioral science efforts across the UN system over the last year. And then finally, I'll conclude with some remarks about a call to, uh, or call to action, essentially, to engage with behavioral science across the UN if you would like to do so outside of UN Behavioral Science Week. So as mentioned by USG Rider at the start of this session, this is the fifth UN Behavioral Science Week. Um, so quite unbelievable, given where we were five years ago with just a handful of UN entities. Today, we bring together 26 UN entities across 17 events. You'll hear from topics ranging from health, climate, gender, peace and security, really a wide variety of, of areas the UN is touching upon with behavioral science application. There's also, there are also a number of more advanced discussions we have when it comes to artificial intelligence and behavioral science, as well as thinking through how entities can embed behavioral science into their work. So kind of getting at some of the questions of the panel here, how do you go from one project to two projects to capacity building, strengthening? When do you apply that? How do you apply that? Um, so we'll be having some of those discussions later on the week and we'll put the agenda in the chat for those of you who haven't seen it just yet. Um, and you'll also notice about the agenda that almost all of the events are run in collaborations amongst UN entities. This has really been an effort for colleagues across the UN to work together and to design a series of events that reflect their work uh, and, and their understanding of behavioral science. So I can't possibly speak to all of the, the speakers in the week, there's a lot there, but I did also want to draw your attention to um, uh, USG Professor Marwala, who's the rector of the UN University. He'll be joining us later on in the week, as well as a number of academics from leading institutions such as Harvard, Sanford, and the London School of Economics. So definitely encourage you to check that out to hear more about these issues from from the UN, uh, the UN side, the UN practitioner side as well. Okay, so now onto a bit of an update about behavioral science across the UN. 
So I will leave you to explore what individual entities are doing throughout the week, because there's a lot there from each entity level. We've heard a bit from the World Bank and UNFPA today, but there's a lot um, in, in the, the 26 entities to varying degree. Um, so, so that's the entity side, but from our perspective and my perspective in particular as the senior advisor in behavioral science to the executive office of the secretary general and the UN Innovation Network, um, we've been working across three areas broadly. So I'll speak to those and um, what, where we, what we have done over the past year and a bit about where we're going. So the first is something that was mentioned by USG Rider at the start of the session, and it is the pilot UN Behavioral Science Fellowship Program, where we actually brought behavioral scientists into the UN to work on projects, finding those opportune moments, as Dean mentioned a little bit, it's not just finding the expertise, but how to apply the expertise. And so these fellows came from the Global North and the Global South, and they worked on topics ranging from promoting decent work with the ILO through to reducing admin burden, like topic again, sludge reduction that was mentioned by Lucia um, with the Food and Agricultural Organization. So in the future, we're hoping to really expand our collaborations and networks with academic institutions in the global north and south to bring more behavioral scientists in the UN. We are able to find those moments where you now we're looking for behavioral science to, scientists to work on them with us. So um, that's one area that we're really focusing on in the near term future and where we've, we've sussed out a little bit already. And then secondly, we are um, looking to promote more of a community when it comes to behavioral science, obviously within the UN, there's a lot going on, but also an engagement with particularly behavioral scientists and behavioral science practitioners in member states. So we've held a number of discussions at the working level, as well as collaborations to bring behavioral scientists in the UN together with member states to, to work collaboratively on projects. There's a lot happening um, on both sides. We'll be doing more of that in the future as well. And then finally, touching upon this remark that was made by the panelists of how do we build capacity? What does it mean to do that? So over the course of the year, we've run a number of events, training opportunities, but in the future, we're hoping to kind of consolidate that a bit more, both at the working level, so such that colleagues have a common understanding of what behavioral science is, the value it provides, what, are the, what maybe some of the critiques around it as well. And then also at more senior levels, how do we engage with more senior individuals, such as those in the panel and everyone in between to, to really start to be champions for behavioral science overall? So that's the update of behavioral science in the UN. And then finally, um, a call to action for those of you who would like to engage with us. So I, in, in my work in the UN Innovation Network, I lead what's called the UN Behavioral Science Group, which is uh, brings together over a thousand UN colleagues from more than 60 entities and 110 countries. So there's quite a lot of interest and demand when it comes to behavioral science across the UN. It doesn't matter where you are along the spectrum, you can be brand new to behavioral science or, or a seasoned behavioral scientist, there's a space for you in the group. As mentioned by USG Rider, the UN generally is kind of is at the early stages of its journey in behavioral science. There are lots of people new to, new to the field, so you're welcome no matter where you are. So anyone in the UN can join, but if you are outside the UN and you'd like to engage with us, you can join as an observer. So we currently have observers from governments, international organizations outside the UN, academia, civil society, private sector. So really our intention here is to bring colleagues outside the UN into the discussions, into our conversations, and to, to form potential collaborations and partnerships along the way. So that's the group. And again, the link is in the chat to join the UN Behavioral Science Group, as well as to check out the agenda. In terms of the week, what we're hoping to, we're very much looking forward to engaging with you all. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing you soon. Thanks. Great. So for those of you who post questions, um, please join the behavioral science group so you could be part of the ongoing conversation and then your answers will be, <laughs> your questions will be answered. And thank you so much for posing them. Um, I mean, then it shows really an increasing level of interest. I learned so much from listening to our eminent panelists. I mean, the, the, the need for behavioral science to be part of the whole entire um, policy cycle to really partnering to cover the entire value chain, et cetera. I mean, it just, um, it's just been a really incredible panel. Thank you so much to the panelists from taking time from your very, very, very busy schedules to join us this morning. And, um, and I would really like to, uh, as Mary just said, um, ask all of you to, those of you tuning in, to join the rest of the Behavioral Science Week. Um, as Mary said, we have 17 events. And, and 26 UN entities. And even if, if you can't make them, uh, recordings will be made available. So really try to check out as many uh, sessions as possible. And, and, and please join the behavioral science group if you're not already a member. And, um, and then we, as it, the, I mean, it's very clear that it's an emerging field for most of us at the UN. And uh, we need to continue to, to, to increase our understanding of it and how we can do better 
so that we can have a better impact on on the ground so thank you so very much and um, i look forward to seeing you in other places and to continuing this discussion thank you <laughs>